invite you to please turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 14, verse 53. Mark chapter 14, verse 53, as we continue our life-changing look at Jesus. If you're visiting with us, welcome. It's great to have you here. For the last three and a half, almost four years now, we as a church have been working chronologically through the life of Jesus, and it just so happens that this morning you join us at the end. In Mark chapter 14, verse 53, we find Jesus in the middle of the night, most likely after midnight, which means today is the day. This is the day that Jesus will lay down his life for the sheep. This is the day that he will be crucified. I've had you turn to Mark 14, but I'm going to read before we get to Mark 14, a passage from Isaiah 53. Last week, I began by reading Isaiah 53, verses 3 through 6. That's a prophecy, promises that were made about Jesus 700 years before he lived and died and rose again. This morning I'm going to read the very next verse out of that prophecy, Isaiah 53, verse 7. This is what God promised. He said that he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This morning, as we work through our text, we're going to see this prophecy come true in the life of Jesus. Like last Sunday, as we just consider the final 24, 36 hours of Jesus' life, we don't have points. Again, this is not something that we're studying. This is looking at a mosaic of the most beautiful yet horrendous event imaginable. It's priceless. And so rather than studying it with points, we're just looking at it. We're looking at it scene by scene. And so I just want to invite you once again to look at Jesus, to see him. Imagine, meditate. And this morning we're going to be looking at these final three scenes that lead up to his actual crucifixion. So scene one, beginning in verse 53. It says, and they, and we come to the word they, and I immediately got to stop and start talking. They. Who's they? That's the group of religious cops, so to speak, that came out with Judas with their clubs and their swords to arrest Jesus in the garden as he prayed. What a, what a picture that is. Oh, there's a man praying. Let's go out and arrest him with swords and clubs. Well, they led Jesus, verse 53, to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. So they interrupt Jesus' prayer meeting in the Garden of Gethsemane. The high priests do this, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. These guys make up what is known as Israel's ruling council. The Sanhedrin was the technical phrase. This is the group that has been contriving to destroy Jesus. They want him dead. And this verse tells us that all of them gather together. And when all of them get together, that's 71 old men. Which makes me wonder, what are they doing up so late? <laughs> well, they had murder on the mind. Tonight is the night. 
Judas is out there working as their secret agent. And tonight, Judas would deliver Jesus into their hating hands. So that's how Mark sets the scene. But then he changes directions here for just a moment. In verse 54, he says, And Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. And he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire. And we don't have time to focus on Peter this morning. We're taking a life-changing look at Jesus, not Peter. And we're rushing to the resurrection for Easter. But I want to point out what an odd scene this is. Peter's following at a distance. The last time we saw Peter, he was abandoning Jesus, fleeing like cockroaches when the lights are turned on, along with the rest of the disciples. That was verse 50. We learned about it last week. This, of course, this abandoning of the Lord by Peter, it came after Peter staunchly, emphatically, it said, Lord, if I must die with you, I will not abandon you. Well, that didn't last long. And so he's ran from the scene, but here he's re-entering the scene, and he's at what's called the palace of the high priest. That's the same place Jesus is at. Jesus is upstairs. You see, they're at the private residence of the high priest. It's, it's multi-story. Jesus is facing, he's under trial in one of the upper rooms. And now court, Peter find himself, finds himself down in the courtyard, the open air courtyard in the middle of this palace, warming himself up at the fire, sitting there. And who's he sitting next to? The guards. Now, these are possibly the same guards that just arrested Jesus. But they are definitely the same guards that are going to beat Jesus up in verse 65. What a curious seat Peter finds himself sitting in here warming himself up next to the enemies of Jesus. So Mark throws that in, but now he leaves Peter sitting there by the fire, and he takes us back upstairs into the palace of the high priest where Jesus is being tried. Verse 55. Now the chief priest and the whole council were looking, the idea here is they're it says seeking, but the idea is looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Okay, so immediately we're given our first clue that the trial of Jesus is a complete charade. What judge goes looking for witnesses to try to get the outcome of the trial, the death of Jesus, pre-planned before it even starts? It's a charade. They're looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death. Verse 55 continues, but they found none. Of course they didn't. Jesus is innocent. But they found none. Verse 56, for many bore false witness against him, Jesus, but their testimony didn't agree. And some stood up and bore false witness. They lied against him saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with human hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. Now, church, this is a very serious charge. You need to remember that the temple is the center of Jewish life. It is the center of the worship of Almighty God. The temple, of course, is there in Jerusalem, and that's why there's all these spiritual pilgrimages, pilgrims coming in for their pilgrimages. During, pilgrimages? That's a weird word. That's why there's all these people in Jerusalem. <laughs> Upwards of two and a half million people. They're there to go 
to the temple. And these guys are accusing Jesus of plotting a terrorist attack to blow the temple up, to destroy it. So here's the question for us. Did Jesus promise to destroy the temple? Did he say that he would destroy the temple and that he would build another one in three days? No, they're misquoting him. He said something close to that, but that's not what he said. You see, they're bringing up, these witnesses are bringing up a conversation that Jesus had had with them two years before. Two years prior, Jesus had similarly come into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. He saw that the temple was full of thieves, money changers, sacrifice sellers, and he went in there and he cleared it out. This was the first cleansing of the temple. And when he did it, the Jew said, by what authority do you do these things? This is way back in John chapter 2, verses 18 through 21. What authority do you clear this temple out with? What authority do you have? And Jesus answered them there in John 2, 19. He answered them and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up, raise it up. Here's where our English language fails us. Destroy this temple. Who? What are you talking about, Jesus? You see, in the Greek, we can see that this is a verb, and the verb has persons. It's a second person plural, which means he's saying, you all will destroy this temple. Or you could put it, when you all destroy this temple. Is he saying he will destroy the temple? No. He's saying they will destroy the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. We need to pocket that for later. We're going to bring it back out. Did Jesus say he would destroy it? No, he said they would. Verse 60. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? They just accused you of being a terrorist. They just accused you of threatening to destroy the temple. Have you no, have you no answer to make? Silence. The high priest continues, what is it that these men testify against you? Now, in our literal word-for-word -word English translation here, that kind of, like, what, what does he mean? What is it that these men testify against you? The sense is, the meaning behind this question is, are you not going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? Verse 61, but he remained silent. And made no answer. Just like Isaiah 53 verse 7 said. Like a lamb that's led to a, the slaughter is silent. Like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. He opened not his mouth. Verse 61 continues. Again, the high priest asked him. Are you the Christ? The son of the blessed? Now. That's an awkward question in today's vernacular. Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? What the high priest is using here is a fancy word called circumlocution. That's a word I could not pronounce in the first service. So praise God, he has answered my prayers and I was able to say it. Circumlocution. Oh, now there we go. Pride comes before the fall. What does this fancy word mean? Well, that's a tool, a speaking tool that the Jews would use when they were talking about God. They, out of fear and reverence for God, would not name, would not speak the name of God out loud. And so they would use other words, circumlocution, instead of the name of God. So in this case, 
he uses the word blessed. In other places, instead of referring to like the kingdom of heaven, or I'm sorry, the kingdom of God, they would talk about the kingdom of heaven. These are words that are used in place of speaking the name of God. And so when the high priest asked Jesus, are you the son of the blessed? He's really asking him, are you the son of God? Verse 62, and Jesus said, I am. I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Now the high priest, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the men that made up the Sanhedrin, they are not biblical dummies. They know exactly what Jesus is saying. He's quoting Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. It's a prophecy. It's a prophecy where the Son of God, who's called the Son of Man in Daniel and here, when the Son of Man goes and he talks to the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days is God the Father. Daniel just got done giving this incredible picture of the throne room of heaven where God the Father is. Now God the Son goes in and he talks to the Ancient of Days, God the Father. And to him, this is what that passage says there in Daniel 7, to this man in the clouds, to him was given dominion, so given to Jesus, will be given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, all nations, and all languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed." So these guys ask, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed, the son of God? Jesus says, I am. And let let me remind you of the fact that I come from heaven. I'll return to heaven, but then I'll return a second time. And that time I will not come as a suffering servant, as the lamb of God who will be crushed. No, I will come as judge and though you might think as you sit there in your chairs judging me now in this false illegal trial please know that I will come again and on that day you will find me to be judge and though your judgments might last for a day or three my judgments will last forever Jesus, does he say that? He doesn't say that, but church, that's what's implied by him quoting these scriptures. That's why in verse 63 we read, the high priest tore his garments. He said, what further witness do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. Did Jesus just commit blasphemy? Blasphemy? No. He looked him square in the eye, and the one time he opens his mouth during the trial, he tells him the truth. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? For him to remain silent, for him to not give an answer, would have been to mislead them. And so he says, I am. And rather than these men falling to their knees in fear, and trepidation, and humility, and repentance. Instead, they tear their clothes and say, what further witness do we need? He's committed blasphemy. What's your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. The religious leaders of the people of God sentenced God to death. And with that, the trial is over. But as I've alluded to already, make no mistake about it, this trial was a complete joke. Illegal, in fact. Why do I say that? Well, I'm going to give you six reasons. There's more reasons, but I'm just going to fly through six. For starters, this trial, so-called trial, it did not take place in a courthouse. It took place at a guy's home. 
A real trial would have taken place at the temple in the chamber of the hewn stones. Not huge stones, hewn stones. That was the official place where the Sanhedrin would meet. That's where they would conduct their business. That's where they would conduct legal trials. But that's not where they conduct this. They conduct it upstairs in a bedroom of the high priest. Second, was it a bedroom? I don't know. That, 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 was, that was me. That was not from the text. But you kind of get the idea, right? This isn't a courthouse. This is a guy's house. Second, this trial took place at night. According to the Mishnah, trials must never take place during the night. They always must take place during the day. And they must never take place the night before a Sabbath. What day's the next day? A Sabbath. And the Mishnah told us that these trials must never take place during the holy days, during the festivals. What's going on? The Passover festival. This trial broke all three of those rules. Third, Jewish law dictated that during a trial, the Sanhedrin must first hear testimony from witnesses arguing that the accused person is innocent. Then you bring in the witnesses to argue that the person is guilty. This, of course, helps the accused person have a fair trial. But in this trial, no witnesses to defend Jesus are ever called. Fourth, verse 55 tells us that the Sanhedrin sought testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Old Testament law required that you had two, if not three, cooperating witnesses in the cases of capital punishment. Here, they found zero cooperating witnesses. Fifth, the charge of blasphemy. That's what they ultimately charge Jesus with, and they sentence him to death for. Well, blasphemy can only be proven if people hear the person curse the name of God in their presence. Does Jesus curse the name of God in their presence? He never curses the name of God. Not in their presence or ever. It's unthinkable. Six, even if he had, which he didn't, but even if he had cursed the name of God, he had committed blasphemy. The punishment was not crucifixion on a Roman cross. It was stoning. It would have required the Jewish leaders to take the whole congregation, so a large group of people from Jerusalem, they would have had to go outside the city walls, they all would have picked up rocks and killed Jesus by throwing rocks at him. But they didn't want that. Oh, they were afraid of the crowd. They hadn't gotten to the crowd yet. So instead of following the Bible, they march out to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, and they seek crucifixion rather than following the law. They didn't want to be culpable. Church, the trial of Jesus was a complete sham. It was illegal. I'm telling you, as we value Jesus, as we look to Jesus, as we think about Jesus, this is something that can be lost by us. So many of us think that the, the pain, the suffering, it starts, you know, when the lashes start, when the scourging starts. And this guy suffers through the injury. He's ripped out of the garden as he's bleeding stress sweat bullets. As he's asking the father, take this cup from me. He's ripped from there. He's thrown into this trial. He's not given a fair trial. This is the kind of stuff that Hollywood movies love. Why? Because it hits us with all the feels. When was the last time you read this passage and your heart broke for Christ? The injustice. The very court that God 
had given the responsibility to uphold his word, to uphold his law, that very court is the one that turns a blind eye to it. The just God being found guilty by his unjust court. It's so ironic. I wish there was a better word than ironic to describe it. But this trial is filled with irony after irony after irony. Let me give you a few other examples. Thinking back now a little bit, I told you to put this in your pocket. We're pulling it back out. What charge, what charge did the witnesses originally make against Jesus? That he was a terrorist, that he was going to blow up the temple. He said, I will destroy this temple, and in three days he'll build it back up. Question for you. Ironically, who ends up destroying this temple built with human hands? Was it Jesus? No. The temple that the Sanhedrin is so worried about protecting during his trial, who destroys it? The Romans. The very people they're now looking to Jesus to try to destroy Jesus through crucifixion with. We've been learning about the Romans destroying the temple from Matthew 24 and 25. How ironic is it that they accused Jesus of wanting to destroy it, but then the people they look to to help them out are the ones that actually destroy it. Do you see it? The irony continues. The temple this place where I've already said the Jews went to to have access to God. It's where they would go to commune with God and to worship him. Supposedly, the religious leaders, they're worried about protecting this, this place where they have access to God. Where they, what they failed to realize and this is what Jesus has been saying since he arrived in Jerusalem, is that under their leadership, the Sanhedrin's leadership, the temple, this place where you're supposed to have access to God, this temple had become all show and no substance. Do you remember me preaching a sermon about this like three, four months ago? This is why Jesus went in and he cleansed the temple it's because it was just all show. There was no substance. They were pretending like this is where you could have access to God. But when you go there, it's just full of robbers. A den of robbers is what Jesus called it. And he used the fig tree as a living illustration. Do you remember? The living metaphor, the fig tree that looked like it should have fruit on it. And Jesus was hungry. So he went to the fig tree and it was barren. And so he cursed it. And he says, you're all substance with no show. And as a result, no one will eat of you ever again. That is what's happening with the temple. You're all show. No substance. No one will eat of you again. You see, Jesus is not only saying that the temples all show no substance. He's also teaching that he was there to replace the temple. He was the one through whom access to God would be granted. He was the one through whom we would go to worship and sing and pray in Jesus' name. You see, Jesus didn't say in John 14, 6, and remember, John 14 is the same week that we're in right now, the final week of Jesus. That's when he gives us John 14. He didn't say in John 14, 6 that the temple will be the way, the truth, and the life, and that everyone can go to the Father through the temple. No, did he? What did he say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. You see, Jesus replaced the temple built with human hands. So stop looking to a temple 
look to Jesus. That was his message. He is better than the temple in every way. Speaking of the temple, the ironies continue. Do you remember when God originally promised David that one of his offspring would build the temple? This happened back in 2 Samuel chapter 7. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13, 12 through 14, I should say, God is talking to David. And he tells David in verse 12, when your days are fulfilled, in other words, David, when you're dead, and you lie down with your fathers, you're in the grave next to them, I will raise up, almost the picture of resurrection. God says, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house, a temple for my name. Let's hit pause on 2 Samuel for a second. What we have here is God very clearly promising David that his son and his descendant would build a temple, a house for him where people could go and meet with God, commune with God, worship God. And what you have is you have with this prophecy, like you have with a lot of prophecies, you have multiple fulfillments. You have a near fulfillment where Solomon, David's son, literally got to build God's temple. It was called Solomon's temple, and the glory of God descended upon it. It was glorious, okay? So that's the near fulfillment, but you also have a far fulfillment. You see, Solomon in his temple was a picture of the temple to come. So when God promised David, one of your descendants will build a temple for me, who's the ultimate fulfillment of that? Jesus. When did Jesus build a temple? John chapter 2, verse 19. Destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it back up. Jesus replaced the temple. It's taken 46 years to build this temple. The Jews responded. But he was speaking, verse 21, about the temple of his body. The irony. The irony. The Jews are so worried about the temple being destroyed. Does Jesus destroy the true temple of God? No. Do the Romans in AD 70? They destroy the physical temple. But when it comes to destroying the temple that Jesus said would be destroyed, it started with the religious leaders, the high priests, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes, the men who work in the temple, pretend to love the temple, the men who claim to be so eager to protect the temple. They are the ones who destroy God's temple in the person of Jesus Christ. How ironic is that? But fear not, Jesus promised to raise the temple again in three days. Now how do we know back in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that there's both a near fulfillment where Solomon got to build the temple and that Jesus would also be the ultimate fulfillment of that promise, that prophecy, because of what God continues to say in that prophecy. Back to 2 Samuel 7, beginning in verse 13, it says, he shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Church, who is that? Jesus. Verse 14, I will be to him a father and he will be to me a son.
What do the keepers of the temple ask Jesus? Are you the son? And Jesus says, I am. These men are blind. Are you the son? I am. Verse 65, the most tragic irony of all. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying, prophesy. And the guards received him with blows. What a scene. I'm supposed to shut up and go to the next point right now. We don't have point scenes. But my mind cannot get past. God in the flesh standing in front of his leaders, his leaders asking, are you the son of God? Him saying, I am. Here's the prophecy that proves it. And they reject him. And rather than falling to their knees and embracing him, they sentence him to death. Which tells me, church, that when you get a glimpse of Jesus and who he really is, if you harden your heart and you do not fall, Pay him the homage and the respect and the glory that is due his name. Oh, church, that hardness is a dangerous place to be. I'm telling you, wow. If you sit here week after week and your heart continues to grow hard, and you hear a guy up here, look, I might be boring. My wife says I'm not, but she likes me, right? <laughs> I preach my guts out for you. I try to put Jesus on display for you to see. And if you sit there unchanged, Hardened, not because I'm a great preacher, not because I'm a mediocre preacher, but because Jesus is amazing. You are in such dire straits, danger of becoming like these religious leaders who look at Jesus and rather than do something beautiful like we saw Mary do last week, all that she could, You'll spit on him. You'll despise him. You might not really spit, but you spit. We're not here because it's Sunday. We're here to worship the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We need to make sure that we respond accordingly. Scene two. Scene two. Back to Peter sitting in the courtyard next to the fire. That was the trial of Jesus. Now we're looking back at Peter. I'm not going to comment on this. I'm simply going to read it and allow the spirit to work in your heart. We don't have time for me to comment. Verse 66. And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came. And seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you mean. And he went out into the gateway, and the rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But he again denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. The phrase broke down, it's actually a picture of him losing his strength, falling to the ground in shame and weeping bitterly. 
what is seen. Scene three, chapter 15. We'll end with this. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, you have said so. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, because the Jews were under Roman occupation, right? Israel was not a free state. They were under Roman rule at this point. The Sanhedrin didn't actually legally possess the ability to go and have Jesus killed. Not legally. And so they go to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate, who did have the power to sentence Jesus to death. The Sanhedrin, they want Jesus dead for blasphemy, or at least that's the crime they threw at him. But they knew the Roman governor could care less if Jesus committed blasphemy because he didn't even believe in the same God. That was a religious law, a Jewish law. It was not a Roman law. And so the Sanhedrin, and this is why they met in those early morning hours after the trial, they come up with a plan and they trump up charges against Jesus as being a religious zealot, revolting against Rome, claiming to be the king of the Jews. You say, well, that's not in the text. You're right, it's not in this account, but we read of that in Luke chapter 23, verses one and two. Now, if Jesus really was claiming to be the king of the Jews, that would have given Pilate grounds to crucify him then and there. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus replies, you have said so. It was such a wise answer because that would have been enough to kill him. But that's not why Jesus was being crucified not for some trumped up charge of being a zealot king. So he neither affirms it nor denies it. That's when the chief priests start to go ballistic. They're like, oh no, we're in big trouble here. And so they start accusing him of many things. And just like his trial in the middle of the night, Jesus remained silent. Let's look at it again, verse three. And the chief priest accused him of many things. And Pilate again asked him, have you no answer to make? See how many charges, many, many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further answer so that Pilate was amazed. Why is Pilate so amazed? See, there is a divine event that's taking place at this moment. And if you're not careful, you'll miss it. It is no accident that Pilate is amazed. Jesus, with his silence, is not pleading the fifth. He's not exercising his right to remain silent nor is his silence an act or an admission to guilt. His silence is the silence of humble submission and surrender to God's plan to crush him. And that might not sound big, but that's big. Remember in the garden, Jesus was under so much stress that his soul was overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. His sweat had turned to blood. He's begging God, God, is there some other way? 
We emphasized that last week. He ended that prayer with the words, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. You are now seeing, not a pleading son in the garden, but a savior who is saying, not my will, but yours. He's living it out. You see, his silence, his beautiful surrender to God. He didn't fight it. He's not resisting or arguing or complaining. This is the silence of the Lamb as he surrenders, as he lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus could have won any argument, any accusation that the Pharisees and the Sadducees threw his way. Listen, church, that's what he's been doing for the last three years. They'd come up and he would just stump them with their wisdom. And now he shuts up. Pilate, Pilate knows that the Sanhedrin, they're acting out of envy. We haven't read that part yet, but we'll get there in just a moment. But he knows, he still knows that this man isn't guilty. They're full of envy, murderous envy. He's literally watching an innocent man choose not to defend himself, even though the most excruciating death is at stake, death through crucifixion. And so he's amazed. He's amazed at this divine event. He's amazed at his silence. You see, in the face of all this hatred, this abuse, this, this murderous deceit, Jesus doesn't say a word. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. Church, his silence was proving in that divine moment that he is the son of God. He is the one that was promised 700 years ago that would be abused and afflicted and remain quiet. The Sanhedrin and Pontius Pilate, they wanted answers. And Jesus gave them the only answer the Father said was allowed. Silence. The silence that God had promised resounded and Pilate was amazed Jesus gave the only answer he could have he did exactly what the Bible said he would what a scene And we're done, but I'm going to read the next few verses because it kind of closes this sermon and it sets the stage for next Sunday. Verse 6, now at the feast, he used to release for them one prisoner for whom they asked. Okay, this is talking about Pilate. Pilate, he didn't usually live in Jerusalem. He lived up in what's modern day Lebanon, but he'd come down for the festival to keep an eye on things. He stayed on a pal at a palace that was up on the hill on the west side of Jerusalem. It was called Herod's Temple, or Herod's Palace, excuse me. And the Jews every year would go up and walk up this hill, and Pilate would stand there, and they'd ask for them to release a prisoner, for him to release a prisoner, and he would. It pacified the crowd and made everybody happy. That's what's happening. Verse 7, and among the rebels in prison who had committed murder in the insurrection, 
So evidently there's an insurrection. We don't know anything about it. History doesn't give us any records of this insurrection, but there were men who committed murder in this insurrection. And among them, there was a man called Barabbas. And the crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do as he usually did for them. That's release a prisoner. And he answered them saying, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? You see, he's advocating for Jesus. He knows this man does not deserve to die. Verse 10. For he perceived that it was out of envy that the chief priest had delivered him up. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to have him release for them Barabbas instead. And Pilate again said to them, Then what shall I do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd. Church, I want to warn you, be careful of men who want to satisfy the crowd. You see, Pilate knew. He knew, but he was weak. And rather than honoring the God of the universe, he wanted to satisfy the crowd. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them Barabbas. You know what that name Barabbas means? It's a compound word. It's a compound name. The first part of that is bar. The word bar means son. Like bar Jonah, son of Jonah. Bar, Abbas, Abba, son of the father. I mean, that's Jesus. Isn't it? I, mean, this, I don't know what to make out of this name. You have this false son of the father being chosen over the son of God, the son of the blessed. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released for them the son of the father, Barabbas. And having scourged Jesus, scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Now that's where we'll pick it up. I'm just telling you, my heart, it just like craves to preach right now. Like there's a part of me that just wants to Draw these lines between these wicked religious people and ourselves. You know, they stood in judgment of Jesus. We all do at one time or another in our lives, don't we? We all doubt that he is who he says he is. We all doubt that he's better than everything in every way. And so we stand in judgment of him. And though we might not nail him to a cross, we certainly kill his will in our lives. So yeah, I want to talk about that and I want to talk about how we all need to repent and you all need to do this and that, and me, self included. But you notice that's all missing from this story, these scenes. And that's because it's not about us at all in a sense. And what we need to do. It's all about him. And what he did for us. And so today, I just want to leave here thankful that he was silent. That he did exactly what God promised he would do. Hallelujah, what a savior. Next week is going to be rough. It's Palm Sunday. That was three months ago for us, so we're a little ahead of schedule. (laughs) We're going to jump ahead on Sunday to Good Friday, which is the worst name holiday of all time. It's a horrible Friday, but it did accomplish our good. So I just, listen, in this time of Lent that Protestants often reject, I do want to encourage you to be especially mindful of Jesus and what he went through as we come and approach
Palm Sunday, Good Friday, and then of course, Resurrection Sunday. Let's make sure we get a good, life-changing look at Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, I do thank you. I thank you that we don't have to do anything because Jesus did it all. Help us to rest in him, to stand in grace, to know that we are fully forgiven, that it is finished, that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because of what he did, because of what he does. Thank you, O oh Lord, for Jesus. He is truly better than everything in every way. Amen.